Okay, hello, my name is Kevin Curran and I'm giving a talk on preserving data query privacy using searchable symmetric encryption. Okay, so I'm a professor of cybersecurity at Ulster University and I'm delighted to be giving this keynote. So just a little bit about my background. I'm part of the University of or Ulster University. Um, we have four campuses and I'm based in a campus in Red on the west coast of Ireland. Um, in a town called Derry, stroke London Derry, it's got two names um, because of the the religious divide in Northern Ireland for many years. There is where I'm based. Again, you can see London Derry, um, and Derry is the city it's in. Um, we have other campuses in Belfast as well. So, again, so Ulster University has done quite well in what we call research. Um, Again, um, it's a research framework which ranks universities on their subjects again. So out of 88 universities, which um, 89 universities, which have computer science departments, Ulster are ranked 16th. Again, so we have quite a good um, track record in computer science. Um, <clears throat> again, I lead up this cybersecurity and web technologies research group. Um, again, that we, we deal in security, we deal in virtual worlds, serious games, um, health assistive technologies. And of course, my, my realm is cybersecurity, but I'm the group leader for other computer scientists in the team. Again, so I write research papers, of course, I'm um, doing this for many years. That's just some papers I've written. Um, again, one of my PhD students detect anonymous proxy usage, which I look at later. And another one there on creating passwords using a novel scheme. Um, I'm proud to say that my 2006 paper, an evaluation of image-based steganography methods with Karen Bailey is considered a Google classic in multimedia. Um, these are the top 10, again, within that, within that particular category because it's been around for so long and it's been continuously cited. It's not necessarily the, a paper in that category with the most citations, but it has been consistently cited and that's what Google does um, with any papers in this category. Um, and again, I also provide expert witness to law cases um, quite often, given my background in cybersecurity. Um, so that can be quite interesting again, um, I guess. But also one of the most unique things about me is I do a lot of media for, you know, I do a lot of press, radio, TV, um, again, work in blockchain, anything within my area as well. I do a lot of um, interviews with media on that. And how I got into that was uh, many years ago, I was one of the first people to expose wireless networks about 20 years ago. Um, again, so I appeared in the front page of local magazines. And then after that, media organizations started to approach me and ask me to do interviews. And there's been a consistent trend, um, whether it's exponential or not, but I do a lot of interviews, which I hope to drop in the near future because quite simply, there is no money in media interviews. Um, and my time could be well spent elsewhere, but it's just something I did. And I guess I try to capitalize on whenever I can. So I became an influencer because of that. And companies will, before COVID, would fly me around the world to give talks and to just listen. And hopefully I would tweet about what they do. So security is hard. Okay. So we know that, that the good, the bad guys only have to get one way into networks. We have to secure every way. And technology is so complex. Things like this, this is a real story. It's not fake news. Japan's cybersecurity minister has never used a computer. Again, so we're seeing the old age against the, the technology age we're in. And things have to change. This hopefully is the last time we see something like this. Because everything is moved online and security is crucial. So again, we could... Look at there's so many ways to look at the world because data breaches and hacks, but they are increasingly common and they will not go away. People's data is being exploited, it's being leaked online, and this can be used to skim money out of them or to obviously invade their privacy. Um, again, so again, one of the most common vectors for any attacks is still email. Again, people just simply clicking on items they shouldn't. And, one of the key ways around that is employee training, along with obviously tools you can have for filtering spam, community networks and everything else. But increasingly it comes down to the, the weakest link in security, which is always humans. Again, so again, we're seeing emails again. This is just the latest. There's actually um, Vsecure, 
do a kind of um, a top 10 of what the emails are likely to appear in your inbox for phishing. Again, Microsoft, PayPal, Netflix, Facebook. We've all got these emails again. Again, so again, ransomware is a modern scourge of computing. Again, where files are encrypted. Um, again, the only real security against ransomware is to have a, a role in backup, you know, really. But um, again, still the, the consequences of a ransomware attack, even with good backups, can be horrendous. But it really is shows you the importance of backing up data. Again, so some attacks are harder to detect than others again. So here we have one with, if you look under LD.com, which is a supermarket chain, you can see that the D is not really a D and that link can redivert you to a hacker's um, URL, which they have um, obviously um, registered beforehand again. So sometimes it can be hard to spot even what you think is a legitimate link. And here was a, um, a mouse over where you didn't even have to click on the link um, on the PowerPoint, he just had to hover the mice over it, and that was sufficient for the malicious link to be activated. Again, so obviously Microsoft addressed this, but again, there's a lot of people out there who do not update their operating systems again, which is the one, number one thing you should do is operate your operating systems, operate your, update your software, update your devices. Again, so again, security is hard, like I said, but here is a guy who didn't want to put his PC to sleep, so he put a ticking uh, an analog watch with a ticking hand underneath the mouse to keep the computer alive. So some people can be incredibly creative. Um, okay, so security is important. Again, so... I'm sorry, it's completely lost the track. Okay, and move on. Apologies. So IoT. So again, here is an is instance of someone installing what seems to be um, an innocent device, which was a, a thermometer in a lobby fish tank. But hackers were able to access the high roller database through getting uh, breaching the thermometer in the fish tank. So again, IoT is becoming a bit of a nightmare. Um, again, so here is a toilet which can be linked to your mobile phone. You say, well, what's the problem here? Um, again, it was from Satis. So again, they had a free app, an Android app that allowed you to lower the tile of seed as long as, as well as other things. Um, but again, there was a backdoor vulnerability discovered in this again. So it allowed hackers to remotely open or close the lid, flush the toilet, or even activate the built-in B-Day function again. So they could repeatedly flush the toilet, costing money and everything else. So. So, because the app pin was fixed at zero, zero, zero. Again, so anyone can use it even remotely. Okay, so we have to fight back. We deserve to sit on the toilet in peace. Again, so how do hackers find flaws? Again, so they find them through Google dorks, which are search strings you put into Google search engine. And there's one looking for an SQL database with any Gmail accounts in there and the in-text password and in-text passwords. Again, there's a... There's one I did um, looking for passwords and you can see that some of these were in this particular instance here, I got a list of email addresses and plain text passwords. Again, you can also go to Google Hacking Database, GHDB, and find terms again, as you can see there, which allow you to search for particular vulnerabilities in Tomcat servers, mail servers, um, proxies, or mail, you know. Um, again, and of course there are tools like Metasploit, the Metasploit Toolkit, <laughs> Again, which is excellent, and it makes it simpler to run exploits against systems again. So it just takes your hand and makes it quite easy. Of course, we have we have wonderful software like Burp Sweep. Um, again, there's a professional version as well, but this allows you to perform penetration attacks and hijack web sessions as well. So Shodan is a search engine for vulnerable devices online. It's the Google of finding IoT devices, again, with default passwords and everything else. And you can do popular searches or search for particular devices you may want to, whether they're webcams or routers or HTTP, FTP servers as well. So you just type in, for instance, in this case, webcam XP, and then what will happen is you get back a list of IP addresses of webcams which are online. There is one I did in someone's house I've seen them walking by. There's a cafe, which is not too bad, of course. Um, and of course, you can then do an IP address geographical location lookup to see where the IP address is again. So that can lead to security, um, privacy um, worries. 
And then there's also tools which are built uh, on top of Shodan, like Kramorka. And Kramorka just shows you all the cameras within a region which are vulnerable. And you can go outside the house and walk around and look at the house from outside or whatever else. So there are tools again. Tools are always getting better for hackers. That's one of the key things again. So Shodan ID, if you want to go there and visit again, look for MongoDB databases. Again, you type it in, you'll see MongoDB databases, and then you're able to use MongoDB Viewer, for instance, to be able to see what is in those databases, which you can download again. So these are freely available online. Again, so again, denial of service attacks are also becoming more common again. And there were sites like Norse, which are able to show you in real time what's happening, such as here, we're seeing attacks from different regions, denial of service attacks, and of course, and of course, People can make money on these now because they can they can get Bitcoin delivered to them again and effectively remain anonymous. And when I show my students all the attacking tools, I show them the low orbit ion cannon, which is a tiny download, less than um, it's only a few hundred K. Um, and you're able to point it at any small to medium sized website and bring it to his knees within minutes. It's the easiest thing to do within hacking, of course, denial of service attacks. Okay. So, of course, Wi-Fi, there's a Wi-Fi Pineapple again, which is a really good tool for being able to do pen testing and wireless networks. Again, they're very cheap devices. Um, and again, you got a in middle to menu system, which allows you to set up certain things like man and middle attacks. Or, um, again, it just makes it easier for you. It's a wonderful tool again. So Wi-Fi is notoriously um, unsafe. Again, if you're on public Wi-Fi networks, you should use a VPN, a virtual private network. So Ashley Madison is a website to allow you to conduct affairs again. So this was a big breach a number of years ago. And you can imagine if your email address was in Ashley Madison, um, you wouldn't want maybe someone to find out or your again. So when it comes to attacks, there's a kind of a well-proven discovery, enumeration, vulnerability map, and exploit, and then report. This is how we do it. We look for targets, we enumerate them, we do the vulnerability map, and then we exploit. And then if you're a pen tester, you do a report. But of course, you didn't have to have a Madison Ashley data breach to be able to find out maybe if some people were logged onto sites. So, for instance, Adult Friend Finder is a site which is the same for hooking up um, with people. But if I type in kevin.curran at gmail.com, um, I would get this message back. It said invalid email. If you've forgotten your password, you can enter your username or email address below. So invalid email. The problem with this is this is enumeration at its best. If I put in someone's email address and they were in the adult friend finder, I would not get this message back, invalid email. So this is where web developers need to know that you shouldn't give anything away. You should just give a message saying, if your email was in that address, an email would be sent to you. But this tells me whether or not, so I could type in my boss's email address and figure out if they're a member of that site. So this is what web developers need to obviously know about secure coding. Again, so obviously I went to the Ashley Madison website and I downloaded it to see if any of my colleagues were in there. That's just a snap side of it. Again, so again, so what can we do? So again, cloud computing is now an accepted philosophy. Again, it reduces costs, it allows you to scale up, you can make use of different environments again. And most of the world is moving into the cloud environments. But the problem is that you can, the cloud cannot guarantee the security of data during processing, as the current limitations of cryptography prevent data from processed in a encrypted form. Of course, you can go to a cloud service like Dropbox or anywhere else, Google Drive, upload your files encrypted, but you cannot do any processing on them. That is the problem. But what if you could have a service where you can have the private key yourself, you only have the passcode, you can still upload your documents to the cloud to a third party service and still perform computations on the data all the time while it's encrypted. So the cloud service provider does not have access to that data. That is what the holy grail of computing is. Okay, so just to recap, if you want to store data in the cloud, you can encrypt it, but disclose the keys to the service provider. You can also encrypt it, but keep the key private. But of course, you have no ability to search it or operate in the data. Or you can store data unencrypted, of course. But this, if it gets a breach happens, then it's released. So these are the three choices you have. Again. Again. 
So the ideal solution is achieving an optimal balance of data security and functionality within the cloud where the cloud service provider has the ability to search and operate in data while it is in encrypted form. But they still have no knowledge of associated decryption keys or plain text. And that is what searchable encryption offers again. So it's a, it's a subset of homomorphic encryption. So fully homomorphic encryption is impressive in terms of it's got the full range of um, searchability and security, but it's impractical for modern computers. Therefore, what we have is subsets of searchable encryption. So you can have two general techniques, searchable encryption using symmetric key cryptography or public key encryption with keyword search. Again, and both of these use indexes. These are data structures that support the efficient searching by pre-computing and mapping search terms to the documents they occur in. So it's, it's a form of information retrieval. Again, so oblivious RAM is one of the techniques that we particularly use. Oblivious RAM is where every time you do a read, a read operation on memory, you also perform a write operation on memory. Again, so it does the two. Um, again, so again, also with vice versa as well. So it's an obfuscation. It's an attempt to prevent any snooper from being able to see the memory access patterns again so we're trying to have queries where no one can see the query no cloud provider no third party um, and we're also obviously working on encrypted data so we're, we're the only ones with the key and the cloud provider has not got the keys so you might say well all cloud providers are honest but if you really think about hacking all you have to do is pay someone in any company if you're a determined operator um, especially in a nation state you just pay someone. Humans are always the weakest point. Therefore, you cannot trust any cloud service provider. Even if 99.9% .9 are honest, you always have to take the case where someone is um, doing it for money. And the only way around that, the only prevention around that is maths, is encryption. Encryption. So if you have the keys, then it doesn't matter if someone is nefarious within these operations. So here is certain schemes within fun, um, fully homomorphic encryption. And here is where the ideal would be, where it's secure as possible and efficient as possible. And this is where searchable encryption comes in, where it's, it's the most efficient of these schemes, but it doesn't have the full security mechanisms, of course. We're working on technology now using ORAM as well to make bring this further to the right. We're hoping to bring our system over to here, and we believe we have the tools to do that. But I'll talk about searchable symmetric encryption. Again, so again, so again, data leakage again is important, which I'll skip over. So we're one of our early studies was to see how efficient is searchable symmetric encryption when implemented and deployed in the cloud environment, and what its performance costs of preserving data query privacy using searchable symmetric encryption when compared to plain text information retrieval. So we're saying is, what happens if we use our scheme, we upload our documents into the cloud, they're encrypted, we're the only one with the key, but what's the overhead? How slow is it? Because again, we care about efficiency. Again, so again, so obviously you can't just use AES and upload your documents because AES is a block cipher. Again, so that it doesn't encode word by word. So you have to have a different form of doing that. To be able to encrypt data and perform computations on it, what we do with search and encryption is we use indexes again. So the two forms of indexes you use, forward indexes and inverted indexes. Again, they both store the same information, but they're optimized for different forms of searching. So a forward index, again, is where you have documents and you have words within there, and then you query the forward index, and that would require sequential iteration through each document. So it's optimized for searching specific documents for the presence of search strings. That's what a forward index is. However, an inverted index is optimized for searching entire document collections for search strings. So this is more potential due to the ability to efficiently search an entire document collection as opposed to specific documents again. So we have a dictionary there. Uh, you might see the words on the left, and there we have uh, postings, and then that would tell you which documents Brutus appears in. Brutus appears in document one, and so does Caesar. Um, you know, whereas Brutus, Caesar, and Copernia appear, all appear in document two. So again, inverted index is more for document collections, which are more real world. So again, if you're looking at um, our diagram here, we have our, our data, we encrypt it. We encrypt the data. We have a homomorphing function, and then we have our ciphertext with encrypted data, and we upload this into the cloud again. And we're able to do searches on our data and perform modifications on the data using the inverted index. So 
there's a sample index that we're using in their research again, the lexicon on the left, and then the postings, the document IDs, which those words appearing again. And there is the hash table used for the, for, the, for the key value, which contains the first document saying, and then the, the linked posting list will contain the links to the other documents, which contain the keywords that we're trying to retrieve. Or up. Okay. So again, when it comes to potential storage leak, which in search plus um, symmetric encryption, we care about what things are leaked. So we classify things as being trivial leakage or non-trivial leakage. So for instance, uh, the lexicon terms in plain text form, we consider that non-trivial, and the length of individual lexicon terms in plain text form as well in red. But for instance, we don't care about the leakage of the lexicon terms in ciphertext form or total number of lexicon terms in inverted index as well. And likewise, in the search pattern, we, have a, we, we deem things as either trivial or non-trivial, depending on the search pattern, the access pattern. Again, we're worried about a third party trying to snoop on our queries and trying to use it by inference methods. What we are updating or what's been stored, what are we searching for? So we're trying to provide a complete black box from end-to-end -end encryption so that no one, no nefarious third party, man in the middle, cloud provider, anyone else can see what is occurring what is in place so again rather than using one array for each lexicon term we use a 1d array to store all the postings for all the terms again so there's our array index for document ids and then this way the setup leakage amounts to the total number of postings for the entire lexicon and again this is trivial leakage this does not give much away again so just alongside the doc id and the hash table is an array index denoting the location of the second posting for the term again and at the array index is the doc ID of the second posting, as well as the array the index denoting the location of the third, third posting, etc. Again, so there's just um, our ciphertext storage and search engine when we're de developing this, the activity diagram of it. And then on our test data, we use five, six different document corpuses. One had one document, the other had 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and the last one had 18,828 documents with over 5 million terms. And there were 377,000 unique terms within that document um, corpus, again. And these came from 20 news groups, again. So when we're looking at the, the inverted the invert index construction um, at time, you can see there is linear, again, in the amount of um, time it took to construct the index, again, more in the, uh, for the symmetric, um, searchable symmetric encryption index, again. Um, quite linear, of course, the time. And then with document encryption time and the inverted index upload time again, which is important, we can see that they're more or less linear in time. Again, so the inverted index, again, the document encryption time, and then uploading the index again, because we need to have an index to be able to retrieve documents again at a later time. Again, and just the plain text IO uploading versus the symmetric search encryption, as you can see, we just have um, um, slightly higher Again, here with the plain text searching ciphertext, again, we have an increase in speeds or a decrease in performance slightly um, with the searchable symmetric encryption. Again, so our conclusions were, that, so symmetric searchable encryption is slower, but this would be expected as searchable symmetric encryption requires a client to generate an inverted index, encrypt the underlying document collection and upload both of these to the server. And then the server needs to decrypt these postings in searchable symmetric encryption query. So again, the tasks were constructing the um, the index, converting it to uh, an encrypted index, time to encrypt the document collection, and these were all directly proportional to the amount of information involved. Then we looked at search, the time taken to identify and decrypt the postings associated with a given lexicon term, and that's directly proportional to the number of postings with the exception of test sets five and six. Um, and it's, def it's efficient if deployed in an environment where results only have to be returned to the user in small quantities, such as a search engine. And this is irrespective of size of underlying data, as only a small number of postings need to be decrypted at a given time. So it's not efficient for large data sets, as the search time is directly proportional to the number of matching postings, which is likely to be significant for large data sets. Again, so ultimately we need to be aware that searchable Symmetry encryption provides data query privacy in exchange for the efficiency associated, associated with plain text IOR, and that is searchable symmetry encrypted inverted index, while slow to construct for large data sets, 
is designed to achieve efficient search speeds while maintaining data privacy for many use case scenarios. So just to conclude, I'm also a co-director, executive director of the Legal Innovation Center at Ulster University, where we work with law firms and we try to bring legal technology. And some of the cases, we work with some of the biggest law firms in the world, including Alan Overy, working with them for the last four years, and they've given us three quarters of a million pounds. Um, again, so that's something I'm proud of doing. Um, I've also worked on detecting proxies again. Um, proxies, you can have anonymous relay proxies again, which disguise your geographical IP address again. So we worked on this trying to, can we determine from a packet whether it went through an anonymous proxy? And it turns out that a lot of the anonymous proxies share the same code base and they leave certain markers on packets. So using machine learning, we were able to figure out if a proxy, if an IP packet came through anonymizing proxy. And that's important for things like banking. Banking, if you're logging in from Nigeria, for instance, maybe that's a red flag for a bank to phone you up and say, is that you conducting this transaction? So it's important to be able to overcome. Sorry. It's also, it's important to be able to determine where someone is geographically um, um, with regards IP addresses. Well, it turns out Donald Trump's Twitter account was hacked again for the second time. Uh, the guy guessed the president, a Dutch hacker guessed his password as being MAGA2020. I don't know where second factor authentication was. I think he needs a better security team, but um, yeah, he won't be the last celebrity that gets hacked or the last celebrity or person who has a data breach. So security is important. Um, I hope I gave you some insights into it. And... Um, I wish I was there in person and I just hope COVID ends soon so we can meet people face to face and build good contacts and real things. So take care. Okay.